just want to point out that from time to time tonight, I will be using a prop. I want you to keep your eyes out for it. You'll see it flying around behind me near the lights. This is one of the locusts from Egypt that we use during Passover. Just keep an eye out for it. It's, it's trained. Relax. So happy to be here with you. I want to welcome those online tonight as well all around the world. You know, what's interesting is uh, not only did Yeshua raise from the dead here in Jerusalem, but he, he rose for you too around the world. Amen. Not just for us, but for all mankind. Grab your Bibles tonight. Faith comes by hearing. Keep going with it. Hearing by the Word of God. So we need to get into that tonight. I'll encourage you to turn to two main, two main passages, one in Matthew and one in 1 Corinthians. So I'll give you some time to get there. We'll arrive at those passages a little later in the teaching tonight. And I'm going to read several scriptures prior to that, but that's where we will end up later on. You know, several of us have already um, partaken of, uh, of a Passover Seder. If you've already had a Passover Seder this week or on Passover this year, raise your hand. Have we already had? Good. Many of us have. And remember, there's still other Seders that are going to go on this week in our community groups. So make sure you're connecting with our community groups. And someone asked me, is it kosher to have multiple Seders? That wasn't even fun. I don't know why you're laughing at that. You were expecting something funny, but nothing was there. There are two things I want to point to in Scripture that tell us it's kosher. Number one, the Bible says that for those that were unclean during the first Passover in Nisan, 30 days later, there was the allowance for a second Passover. So if you haven't celebrated Passover yet, we'll assume you're unclean. And what else are we to assume? You're unclean. You can do it next month. But you know what's second? Another indication that, that it's okay, that it's kosher to have maybe a, a, a two seders. If you, if you go back to the gospel writings and you read about Yeshua, and he, he has the seder with his Talmudin, with the disciples, you don't see his family there. Because in the first century, it was customary for the rabbis of the day to have a a, a first Seder with their students to walk them through it and to teach them all the depths of the symbolism. And that could have been a day before the official Passover. And then, of course, he would have traditionally had Seder with his family, which was the commandment, to have it with your family in your house. So we can see maybe even from the gospel writings there was some flexibility that Yeshua may have in previous years had a Seder with his Talmudim and then the next day had a Seder with his family. But on, on the year, of course, that we're celebrating now uh, through Passover in the gospel accounts, we're talking about his death and resurrection. So on that particular year, he had the Seder with his Talmudim, but he didn't have the Seder with his parents. With, of course, Joseph probably was gone by then, but Mary was still there. How do we know? Because she shows up the very next day as we move toward the sacrifice of the Lord. So is it kosher to have two satyrs? Yes, it is. It is kosher. So have as many satyrs as you want. Right? He says as often as you'll do it. Right? So eat away. I just want to warn you, if you're getting up in years, and you're eating lots of matzah. <laughs> see, you guessed another joke there. There was not a joke there. All I was going to say was drink lots of water. Drink lots of water. You know, we're rejoicing today because we know the goodness of the Lord. We know the victory of Yeshua over death. But I want to start tonight by reminding us that in the biblical day, the day of the writing of the Gospels here, this was not a happy day. It's a great song. It was a perfect segue. We're happy but their day was not happy. you got to remember, they've gone through Passover now. They're, they're several days into unleavened bread. They've arrived at the Feast of First Fruits, which is today. I'll get into that in a moment. They've arrived at First Fruits, which should be a glorious day of bringing offerings and worship to the Lord. But it is not a happy day for them. Not for the disciples. Not for the followers of Yeshua. Because they woke up on that First Fruits day and their Messiah was dead. 
Or so they thought. But imagine you've put all your hopes and your dreams, your future, all your prophetic interpretations on this person. It's on Yeshua. You think God has come in the flesh and he's going to save us from our sins and from Rome and from everything that ails us. And everything you put your hopes and dreams on is now in a tomb. And you wake up on the day you're supposed to worship and it starts off as a very sad day. And the ladies, as we'll read in a few more, they run. They get to the tomb first. And then we have the account of the guards and the angel and then we get into the story. And Oh my goodness, the sad day turned into a very happy one. So let's back up a little bit. Let's find out where this day really began, this day of first fruits, this day of the resurrection. I'm going to read a passage from Leviticus 23 just to lay the commandment foundation for it first. Leviticus 23, 4 through 16. These are the Lord's appointed feasts, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. And on the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. And on the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days, present an offering made to the Lord by fire. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord, so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. On the day that you wave the sheaf, you must sacrifice a burnt offering to the Lord, a lamb a year old without defect. Together with its grain offering, two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made to the Lord by fire, a pleasing aroma, and its drink offering, a quarter of a hen of wine. You must not eat any bread or roasted or new grain. Until the very day you bring this offering to your God. This is to be an everlasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. 15. From the day after the Sabbath, the day that you brought the sheep of the the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath. And then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. These are what we call the spring feasts of the Lord. Pesach. Chag HaMatzah, the unleavened bread. Yom HaBikurim, the first fruits, counting 50 days to Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. The Bible actually has several names for this day, and today is Yom Rishon, right? The first day of the week. It's the first day after the Sabbath. When was the Sabbath? The Sabbath was yesterday. That was the holiday Sabbath because Passover led us to that Sabbath. Yesterday ended the Sabbath. Today is the first day after the Sabbath. Therefore, according to the word of God, today is first fruits. It's a big day for us here at King of Kings because today is a commanded holiday of the Lord. Welcome. You've come with us on a journey to the commanded day of the Lord. Yom HaBikorim, the first fruits. It's not the only thing the Bible calls it. It calls it in Leviticus 23, verse 10. Let the first day of counting of the Omer, Omer Rishit. That's why we had Ray begin the service with the counting of the Omer. It's a day of obedience. It's a way for us to obey the Lord, and it's a day to anticipate what God is going to do. But today is first fruits. It is the first day after the Sabbath. And it it coincides today the same way it did on the year that Yeshua died and rose again. Where first fruits was on Yom Rishon. It was on Sunday that year as well. So we've repeated that cycle. And we can connect very significantly to the timeline of the year of Yeshua's death and resurrection. Matthew 28 confirms this for us. The first verse and going forward. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Miriam, a Magdala, and the other Miriam went to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven. And going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and he sat on it. 
His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Yeshua, who was sacrificed. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Matthew here confirms what Leviticus said we should do, that on the first day after the Sabbath, Today is first fruits. So was it the year of Yeshua's resurrection. He rose, my friends, on first fruits. God doesn't really move in the coincidental. Was it an accident that he, that he sacrificed himself as the Passover lamb on Passover? No, it was not a coincidence. Was it a coincidence that he was in the grave taking away our sin? At the same time, we're celebrating unleavened bread, which is likened unto sin. No, not a coincidence. And was it any coincidence that on first fruits that he rose from the dead three days later? No coincidence. This is God's prophetic timetable. We're on God's calendar now. And we can expect great power and great miracles. We should understand a little bit about the feast of first fruits. So we're going to read a few verses. Because I don't know that we'll get the full impact of what Yeshua was involved in in the resurrection until we first understand the foundation that was laid for us leading to the resurrection. Exodus 23, 14 reads this way. Three times a year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. That's this week. For seven days eat bread made without yeast as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv. That's this month. For in that month you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Celebrate the festival of the harvest with the first fruits of the crops that you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year, that's Sukkot, when you gather in your crops from the field. Deuteronomy continues with this same theme in chapter 16. Three times a year, all of your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. At the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, Shavuot, and the festival of tabernacles, or Sukkot. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord, your God, has blessed you. Three pilgrimage festivals every year, the men of Israel were commanded to go where? Here, to Jerusalem. We are the location of where the world was supposed to come. I'm going to tell you something from the book of Zechariah. We are the location where the rest of the world will come. These feast days have great significance. To us, not just in the past, but in the present, and again, continuing into the future. And it says three times a year, the men are to come to Jerusalem, and each time it's after a harvest. The, the Yom HaBikorim, or the Omer Reshit, the, this first festival is celebrating the barley harvest. Then we move to Shavuot, it's the wheat harvest, and at the end, the harvest of ingathering, or Sukkot, you bring in the rest of the harvest from the end of the year. But in all three cases, it says, do not come to the house of the Lord empty-handed. Now, how can it say that? What if there's somebody who's poor? Because in Israel, it is expected that God has taken care of everyone. It is expected that he has given everyone good gifts, that we can rely on the Lord and we can remind him of his covenant promises to us. And that's why he can say, no one come before the Lord empty-handed. Come with the proportion to which the Lord has blessed you. And he's basically saying, and he has blessed every one of you. Now, come before the Lord And give him the honor that's due his name. But never come empty-handed. On the festivals of the Lord, friends, that's an encouragement. We should never come empty-handed. We should come with a full heart of worship, with a heart of service and sacrifice. If we're giving, in whatever way we're giving, our heart should be full. Our hands should be open to give unto the Lord, however he will call us. But 30 times in Scripture, it uses this phrase, the first fruits. So it behooves us to understand exactly what is meant by it. And you might say, well, did the first fruits description start there in Leviticus 23 or even in Exodus 23? No, actually, the story of the first fruits started back in Exodus chapter 1. It's little known that that this is where the the story actually began. And then as the story unfolded, we arrived at our current understanding. But this is the first fruits of men. 
where does first fruits really begin? It begins in Exodus 1, 22, when Pharaoh decides that he's going to make a first move. And Pharaoh makes the first move on the chessboard. This is what it says. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all of his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now the chess match has begun. Pharaoh has made his first move. And it's up to God to make a counter move. So God picks up with that first move. And in Exodus 12, verse 12, this is God's counter move. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and I will strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Pharaoh, your move. Pharaoh moved and God counter moved. And in God's counter move, he checkmated Pharaoh. And then he tells us, and since you saw my great victory, remind your descendants of this miracle. Exodus 13, 11. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you as he promised on oath to you and your ancestors. You are to give over to the Lord the first offspring, remember first fruits, the first offspring of every womb. All of the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, then break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? You say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery. And when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb, and I redeem each of my firstborn sons. Move and counter move. Checkmate and remembrance command. But right here, we just made a connection. We just made a connection and a link between Passover, the plagues of Passover, the judgment on the firstborn as a counter move to God of judgment, and the first fruits of mankind that had to be given back to God. Because God saved our children, we give and dedicate our children back to the Lord. And that's the principle of first fruits. If God gives us blessing, we give our tithe back to Him. If God gives us crops, we give our first fruits of those crops back to Him. And if God gives us children, we give our children back to Him. And this is the first fruits. This is what we're commanded to do. And it didn't start in Leviticus 23. It started in Exodus 1 when Pharaoh decided he was going to make the first move by killing the Hebrew baby boys. Are we the only ones who've made this link? Maybe we've looked a little bit too much into the prophetic realm. Maybe we've found some symbolism and you think maybe, Chad, you went a little too far. Friends, we're not the only ones who've made this connection today between Passover, the plagues, the judgment, and first fruits from mankind. You know, King David was a prophet himself. And in Psalm 78, listen to what King David said, and listen to what he found in the same elements that we're talking about tonight. Psalm 78, 42. They did not remember his power. The day he redeemed them from the oppressor. The day he displayed his miraculous signs in Egypt, his wonders in the region of Zoan. He turned their rivers into blood. They could not drink from their streams. He sent swarms of flies that devoured them and frogs that devastated them. He gave their crops to the grasshopper, their produce to the locust. Locust, go. How cool would that have been if I had said that and that locust came down? We'll tell the people online The locust actually moved. You just couldn't see it. (laughs) He gave their crops to the grasshopper, their produce to the locust. 47, he destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore figs with sleet. He gave over their cattle to the hail, their livestock to bolts of lightning. He unleashed against them his hot anger, his wrath, indignation, and hostility, a band of destroying angels. He prepared a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave them over to the plague. And he struck down all of the firstborn of Egypt, the first fruits 
of manhood in the tents of Ham. King David had a prophetic sense that the Passover and the plagues and the judgments and the sons that had to die were part of the first fruits offering to the Lord. He got this prophetically. He saw it. Verse 51, he struck down all of the firstborn of Egypt, the first fruits of manhood in the tents of Ham. We should see depth here, friends. We should see that the resurrection of Yeshua doesn't stand alone, but it is a culmination of a story and a victory process that has been ongoing. That the prophets saw it. That it was even predicted by God himself when he gave us the commandments. If you're in the book of Matthew, I had told you to turn earlier if you wanted to. Matthew 26. We're going to do a little little bit of a timeline here just to help us. Connecting first fruits with resurrection. First fruits not only of crops, but first fruits of man. Matthew 26, 17 says this. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Yeshua and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So this is before Passover is beginning, right? This is the day before that. This is the day of preparations, the day where we have to make preparations for Passover. What kind of preparations do we make? Well, if any of you have had the Seder this week already, we know there's lots of preparations. The ladies in my house were doing a lot of cooking. The men were doing a lot of eating. But that's okay because later we did a lot of dishes. We balanced that out a little bit. The ladies were doing the cooking. We were cleaning the leaven from our homes. We were sweeping, cleaning rugs, vacuuming. You know, it's, it's wonderful to see sometimes you'll see in Jerusalem people cleaning out their rugs and they put them over the balcony because they're, tr- they're trying to obey. Now, maybe they take it a little too far, but, it, but at least they're trying to obey. They're trying to clean the leaven out of their house. So there's a lot of preparation. And then it's not just about cooking and cleaning. It's about setting forth the elements on the table. Some of you love to decorate tables. We had a wonderful table decorator in our Seder the other night. Because we were so busy bringing out dishes and, and setting things up and making sure the Haggadot were everywhere. And we had one person in particular at their Seder. I'm not going to say who she was, although she's here tonight. And thank you. She would set the table up and she'd step back and take a look at it. And she'd go back and fix something. She'd put candles. She'd move the wine. She'd move the plates. Put the floor. Step back and take a look at it. She didn't like how that napkin looked. She would go over and make that napkin, fold it a little bit different, make a crease. She wanted a crease in that napkin. Then she wanted to put it under the silverware. Take, take, take a look at it and take a step back. And I, I noticed there was about four or five times that there was this really attention to detail. These preparations were being made for the Seder. So I walked up beside her and I just simply said, I think the magazine editor will be here in a few moments to take photographs of this table. <laughs> the table looks good. Job well done. And... The disciples right here are making preparations for the Seder. There's things that need to be cooked. There's cleaning that needs to happen. There's settings that need to be set out. And this is the day of preparations. But we continue in the following chapter. So turn over one chapter, Matthew 27 now. So we notice that they're making preparations the day before the Passover Seder that Yeshua took part of. But in Matthew 27... This is what we read in the prophetic time. The next day, the one after the preparation day, so now Yeshua has already been sacrificed for us. He's been buried and put into a tomb. They tried to take him down off the cross before the Sabbath arrived. This is where we find ourselves in verse 62. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive... That deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body. And they will tell people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb secure as you can and as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone 
and then posting a guard in front of the stone. So there's the day before the preparations, the day of the preparations, then the Sabbath day, they have their Seder. Yeshua's, he's arrested. He's tried illegally, by the way. You know the history of the Sanhedrin? The history of the Sanhedrin is very important here. They were not allowed to hold court in the middle of the night. What they did was very illegal. But this is the only way they could push their agenda forward. There was also a transition at the time of the proconsuls, people that would oversee the, the, the land of Judah at the time, local governors that, that Pilate would answer to. They were in transition, so they, they saw a window of time that they didn't have to answer to a proconsul, and they didn't wait for the lawfulness of the Sanhedrin to meet. They met illegally in the middle of the night to get the conviction that they wanted. This was a, a fake trial. This was illegal what was done. When you go back and read Isaiah 53, think of that, how illegally they tried him, and they brought false judgment on Yeshua. But this is the day after the preparations, and we pick it up in chapter 28, verse 1. And now it says, after the Sabbath, that's today, first fruits day, after the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalena and the other Miriam went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Remember, these are the guards later that the Pharisees told to lie. They could not deny what they saw. They told the Pharisees what they saw. They saw the, an, an angel of the Lord dressed in white. They were impacted by his presence. They fell down like dead men, and then they went to the Pharisees, and they told them what happened. And the Pharisees said, no, we can't let this word get out. We've done so many illegal things, there's no way we can let this get out. But what we can infer from this passage is that the Pharisees, they weren't convincing these guards. The guards weren't buying it. The guards may have taken their money. The guards may have even gone along for the time being with this lie. It doesn't say that they did. But how were the guards going to explain the fact that the tomb was empty? The stone had been moved even though the seal was on it. They were the ones in front of it and they saw an angel. And not only did they see the angel, but they fell down. The presence of God that was on the angel hit them. You know, sometimes when the presence of God is strong enough, your body can't stand up to it. And whether you believe in it or not, you, th you think these unbelieving guards believed in the power of God? Their theology was really off. You know, the Holy Spirit power really doesn't care what your theology is. It doesn't. Holy Spirit power really just doesn't care. It's say, I don't believe... That God Almighty comes to earth and, and moves among men. Really? Go down. I'm sure the guy that was in the party that was arresting Yeshua also didn't believe in the power of God. Where is this Yeshua? Who is he? I am he. Boom, he falls down. I thought you didn't believe in me. Stand up. You don't believe in me. Remember, stand up. Then let's cut somebody's ear off, and let's heal that person. Remember, you didn't believe in me either, but your ear believes in me now, doesn't it? <laughs> when the power of God shows up, friends, it doesn't matter what your theology is. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters that you're in the reality of the presence of the Almighty God. And these guards found themselves in that reality, and they could not deny what Yeshua had done. They could not deny the resurrection. And we know the story, the women, they hurry. The angel says, he is not here, he is risen, just as he said. You know, I wonder how many times, I feel a story coming on. As a parent, parents in the room, anyone have children? Okay, remember you have to redeem that child, don't forget, that was part of the passage of Scripture. Parents, you know your children from birth, you know their tendencies, you know what they're probably going to do, 
They can be heading down a path, and you can say, please don't do that. I know what you're going to do. I'm telling you what you're going to do. I'm predicting what's about to happen in this situation. I am telling you the truth of what is coming. And the child says, no, I don't believe that, Dad. I believe I'm going to step out on my own and I'm going to do it my own way. You say, but listen, I've walked that road. I can tell you what to, at the end of that road. It's not good things. Come back to the way of life. Come back to the ancient path of God. The child says, no, Dad, I, I want to go do this own thing because I don't believe what you said will come true. The Pharisees even reiterated it. Hey, this guy Yeshua said, remember, after three days, he's rising from the dead. Don't forget, he said this. It's almost as if the Pharisees, who did not believe that he was Mashiach, had a little bit more faith that, seriously, that he he might rise from the dead than the believers who he said, I'm rising from the dead. Because the angel had to remind them, remember You came today on first fruits and you expected for him to be in the grave. But don't you remember he told you, I'm going to rise from the dead on the third day. And as a parent, we go through that. God Almighty was probably going through that. And you want to say it with love and not sarcasm. I told you. I told you I was rising from the dead. Who do you think I am? You think death can hold me? Death was merely a creation. It was a merciful creation. How was death a merciful creation? Because when we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden and we could no longer eat from the tree of life, but we had already eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and let sin come into our hearts, do you understand that if we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we were allowed to continue to eat from the tree of life, we would have lived forever in sin and separated from Almighty God. Death was a mere creation in God's process of redemption. This is why death can't hold Yeshua. He was using it as a tool. It's nothing but a tool in his hand. Satan thought he had the greatest weapon there ever was, and it was just a tool in Yeshua's hand. If you're with me in 1 Corinthians, let's turn our attention there for a few moments. Because what we want to share tonight, what we want to make sure we get across in tonight's message is that Yeshua is not only the Passover lamb who was sacrificed, but he is also the first fruits of From the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. The Apostle Paul writes, For what I have received I pass on to you, as of first importance, that Messiah died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. So it confirms here that he rose on the third day just as he said he would. Skip over to verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. But if it is preached that the Messiah has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Messiah has been raised. And if the Messiah has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he was raised and Messiah was raised from the dead. But he did not raise him, in fact, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then the Messiah has not been raised either. And if the Messiah has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Key phrase. Then those who had fallen asleep in the Messiah are lost. If only for this life we have hope in the Messiah, we are to be pitied more than all men. But if Messiah has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Messiah all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Messiah Yeshua, the first fruits, 
Then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Paul got it. Paul got it just like David got it. That when we come through the Passover and we see the elements and we know Yeshua as our Passover lamb and his blood is our atonement, it's on the doorpost of our hearts. And that with unleavened bread, we are removing the sin from our hearts. But that we arrive on God's appointed day of first fruits like it is today. And it's not just a mere day when you're supposed to bring your harvest in. No, God appointed that day to proclaim himself stronger than death. That death could not hold him. That he became the first fruits of life. How can we live if he is not living first? We only live because he lives. So he had to die to take away our sins, but that's not enough. Had he only died, friends, he's nothing but a martyr. You know, it's not hard to believe that he died. Everyone can believe that he died. That's not the challenge. The challenge is not, hey, believe in your heart that Yeshua died. Everyone believes he died. The challenge is, but do you believe that he rose again? That's the faith. That's what takes all the faith. Everyone dies. Minus Elijah and Enoch. And maybe they'll have their time depending on how you read Revelation. But what does it say here? What is the challenge in Corinthians 15? It says, if Yeshua did not rise from the dead, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sin. Because if he's not strong enough to conquer death, then he's not strong enough to conquer your sin. This becomes a very important creed of our faith. We continue. Stay in that same chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 24. He's the first fruits, and then we pick up in 24. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God and the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death, friends, is the last enemy. And when exactly did death become the last enemy? In Genesis 3, when we sinned, and God had to institute death so that we would have separation, so that we would have a chance for atonement, so that we might rise from the dead, a new creation. Remember, the cherubim and the seraphim were placed on the east gate of Eden so that we could not re-enter, we could not go back to the tree of life. But Messiah's victory over sin and death brings the opportunity, at least for those who trust in his salvation, to partake again from the tree of life. What's the goal? How do we get back to this eternal life that we've talked about? We get back to this eternal life when we partake of the tree of life once again. It will happen. It's legitimate. Revelation 2, 7, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 22, 1 and 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to eat from the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. We were not asked only to believe in Yeshua's death. We were asked to, to believe in His resurrection. If our righteousness is by faith, then our faith has to be put in something that may be difficult to believe in. And his death was not difficult to believe in. We've got thousands, if not millions, of eyewitnesses to the fact that he died. Your faith is being challenged tonight in this sense. Do you believe that he rose from the dead? Do you believe in the resurrection of our Messiah? Do you believe that he was the first fruits of the dead? And do you believe that it was perfectly ordered on God's appointed feast day, just like he intended from the very beginning? on that first day after the Sabbath.
We'll close with Romans chapter 10. The last enemy to be defeated is death. And this is the challenge in the creed of our faith. This is where our theology finds its root and its foundation. Before one can say, I am a believer in Yeshua. I know my salvation is secure in Him because I do A, B, and C. Or because I think A, B, and C. Or because I believe A, B, and C. It comes from this passage here. Romans chapter 10. But what does the word say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth. And it is in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we all proclaim. That if you declare with your mouth, Yeshua is Lord. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The resurrection from the dead is part of the faith that leads us in confidence of our salvation. This is why today is so important to us. It's not just that he died. It's not just that the Jews were saved from slavery. It's not just that we found our way to the homeland. Remember the sermon last week. Passover is a great theme for us. It's a new year. It was a new nation. It was a new land. It was the newness of revival. It was a new authority given given to us by Yeshua, and it was the introduction of the new covenant. We covered all that last week. But it's not enough to just believe in the Passover lamb dying. We're challenged tonight to believe in faith that that Passover lamb rose from the dead and that he is the first fruits from the dead. You confess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and you believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, then you are saved. And tonight I think we have a room full of those who would profess, yes, I am saved because I believe that Yeshua rose from the dead. It's not hard to believe that he died, but I believe he rose from the dead. Can we go to the the Lord in prayer as we close? We close this portion because we're going to go back into worship. There may be some here tonight, God, that have heard this message. And they're wrestling in their heart whether or not they believe that you rose Yeshua from the dead. I pray that faith would envelop this room. That they would see it from the scriptures. That they would take it not only from the Brit Hadashah writings, but they would take it from the Tanakh writings. That even King David knew that there had to be a first fruits from the dead because of what God was doing as he judged Egypt. There had to be first fruits, a resurrection, if you will. So, God, we pray tonight that each one of us grow in our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We read the word of God today, and we are saved through faith. And that faith hangs on the fact that we believe that Yeshua rose from the dead. And this is the day. This is the day that he rose from the dead. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your divine plan of redemption. We thank you that it's consistent from Genesis to Revelation. We thank you that you mapped it out for us and you showed us the symbolism. Yeshua, we want to say thank you tonight for dying for us. And yet as much as that cost you, you gave even more. That you resurrected from the dead that we might live. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. If there's any here tonight that have never made a decision in faith that they believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, that he died for our sins and he rose again on first fruits so that he might swallow up death, that we might have life, tonight you're going to have an opportunity. A little bit later on, we're going to invite the prayer team forward. Feel free to come. Get prayer for anything and everything the Lord has on your heart. But especially for those who are making decisions tonight. 